most versatile of the four armed forces of the United States in World War II was the United States Coast Guard. Wherever Americans fought and American ships went, the Coast Guard proved this versatility, contributing effectively to the defeat of Italy, Germany, and Japan. In every invasion, from Africa to Normandy, from Guadalcanal to Borneo, Coast Guardsmen landed American and Allied troops on foreign shores. All the wartime functions of the Coast Guard since November 1941 have been performed as a part of naval operations under Admiral of the Fleet Ernest J. King. In his annual report to the Secretary of the Navy, the Admiral summarized the Navy's progress in the war and cited the role of the U.S. Coast Guard overseas as well as at home. Under the general direction of Admiral R.R. R. Weishi, the Coast Guard has done an excellent job in all respects and as a component part of the Navy in time of war, has demonstrated an efficiency and flexibility which has been invaluable in the solution of the multiplicity of problems assigned. The multiplicity of problems assigned to the Coast Guard required the greatest number of trained personnel in its history. At the Coast Guard Academy in New London, expanded and accelerated programs were instituted early in the war to augment regular training courses with instruction in the new requirements of modern warfare. But a large number of well-trained officers was also urgently needed for the unprecedented range of new and intensified functions along our own shores. To train a 685% increase in manpower in the first years of the war, the Coast Guard opened a number of training stations for enlisted men. Here, in addition to basic seamanship, men were trained for highly specialized jobs to carry out the Coast Guard's exclusive functions along our coasts and in our ports. An established part of the wartime service were the 10,000 spars who took over a variety of shore jobs in the continental United States, Alaska, and Hawaii. By performing 76 different kinds of duties in 26 ratings, they filled their parts efficiently and released thousands of men for duty at sea or in combat areas and to safeguard our busy ports. During the war, ports ranked with airfields as primary military objectives to establish and maintain protective measures in our harbors and along our waterfronts, the Coast Guard was designated as the responsible agency by the Secretary of the Navy. By 1944, the volume of war shipping had increased more than 100% over 1941. And in more than 200 of our busy harbors, captains and assistant captains of the port were stationed to administer the vital security program. After VE Day, when danger to the Great Eastern and Gulf ports was over, Coast Guard port protection decreased to approximately 36 harbors. At the moment a ship entered a port, the Coast Guard became responsible for its safety in passage and at anchor. Professional pilots in the uniform of the U.S. Coast Guard guided the vessels into the harbor, handling in some ports hundreds of ships a day. To facilitate their movements, more than 36,000 aids to navigation were maintained by the service under wartime conditions, though many of the lighted markers had to be dimmed or extinguished to protect the ports from the enemy. As soon as a ship arrived, a Coast Guard officer from a merchant marine hearing unit, together with public health, customs and immigration officers, boarded the vessel to hear any complaints from the ship's company for the phenomenal wartime increase in merchant marine personnel resulted in many problems of discipline and ship manning. Coast Guardsmen sealed the radios on thousands of incoming vessels to comply with security regulations which prohibited radio communications of ships while in port. Specially trained details of Coast Guardsmen 
fumigated countless vessels from stem to stern to prevent the outbreak of epidemics which might have originated in foreign ports. No merchant ship was permitted to leave port before marine inspection officers tested and examined every life-saving device. For in the early days of the war, when merchant vessels were sunk almost daily, the need for effective equipment was a grim necessity. During the Battle of the Atlantic, thousands of merchant seamen owed their lives to such precautions. The inspection of ships for safety did not stop with life-saving equipment, but extended throughout the entire vessel from bridge to bilges. Every structural and operational detail had to be approved by Coast Guard inspectors before the vessel's seaworthiness was endorsed. Subjected to the same examinations as ocean-going ships were those on inland waterways, vitally important as carriers of war supplies. On the Great Lakes alone, six-sevenths of the ore for the nation's armaments and one-third of the world's total grain were carried in merchant ships commanded by temporary reserve officers of the Coast Guard. During the winter months, shipping, which used to be at a complete standstill, became possible after the Coast Guard introduced new and revolutionary ice-breaking equipment to open channels on the Great Lakes. With the enormous volume of shipping at home and abroad, precautions had to be taken to ensure the security of the nation's waterfront installations. Identification units were established in every port to maintain records of all people who were issued identification cards permitting them access to waterfront areas. To prevent a recurrence of World War I port disasters, the Coast Guard took immediate and vigorous steps at the beginning of the war to train picked men in the detection and prevention of attempts at sabotage. The size of the port security job is indicated by the fact that within the continental United States alone, there are more than 21,000 miles of port waterfront with approximately 8,000 waterfront facilities and millions of square feet of docks, piers, and other storage and loading space. Invaluable to the safety of our ports during the war period was the employment of volunteer port security forces who enlisted as temporary reservists in the Coast Guard. Serving without pay, these men released 7,000 regular Coast Guardsmen for duty afloat and greatly contributed to the success of the port security program. Greatest danger to port installations was the handling of gasoline, explosives, and ammunition. To the Coast Guard was assigned responsibility for the safety of these hazardous cargoes while in port. Specially trained details of 4,000 enlisted men and 300 officers supervised the handling and loading of millions of tons of explosives in East, Gulf, and West Coast ports. As many as 600,000 tons of explosives a month passed through these ports. And during the entire war, not a single catastrophe occurred in any area for which the Coast Guard was responsible. To safeguard irreplaceable material, fire prevention rules were rigidly enforced. As a result, despite a tremendous wartime increase in cargoes and tonnage, fire losses were less in many ports than in any average pre-war year. Should fire strike, the Coast Guard was well equipped to combat it with expert firefighting crews. During the war, the service acquired and put into operation the world's largest fleet of over 250 fireboats, stationed in every major port on all coasts. An important phase of national defense was the beach patrol, established during the critical years of 1942 and 1943, when our 50,000 miles of shoreline were endangered by saboteurs and enemy attack. It was a Coast Guardsman who sighted three Nazi saboteurs landing on a beach in Long Island in the summer of 1942, which led to their eventual capture and conviction.
But the need for an offshore patrol when Nazi submarines sank American ships within sight of land was desperate and immediate. Early in 1939, the Coast Guard Auxiliary was established and later used to help combat this threat and to release regular patrol craft for offensive action. A non-military organization of yacht and motorboat owners, they were organized into 584 flotillas with an enrollment of over 17,000 vessels. Of inestimable value in defensive action, they spotted submarines, kept a sharp lookout for enemy surface raiders, and rescued many survivors of sinkings. The need for small boats was so urgent that private yachts were acquired by the service for additional offshore duty. Merchant seamen came to rely more and more on the traditional Coast Guard life-saving stations as offshore sinkings rapidly mounted early in the war. Valuable property and hundreds of lives were saved by surfmen long experienced in rescue work. extend to the ever-increasing transoceanic air traffic, the same life-saving service given ships for over a century, the Coast Guard established, at the request of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an air-sea rescue agency in Washington. For the assistance of flyers in distress, Coast Guard air-sea rescue task units were established along our shores. Here, under the supervision of the air-sea rescue agency, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and rescue experts of our allies developed and perfected numerous new life-saving methods. Fast, powerful boats, whose value was proven in the invasion of Normandy, were adapted for rescue work. As a further measure to save lives, many older and larger classes of Coast Guard vessels, which had distinguished themselves in action, were in 1945 converted from combat uses for air-sea rescue work. In 1945. In steady communication with the aircraft overhead, these ships were stationed out at sea along the important air traffic lanes. Making use of every new technological development, the service spared no effort to devise more efficient methods to save human lives. adopted for air-sea rescue functions, and Coast Guard officers and men were trained in methods new to the service in its historic duty to make life safe at sea and in the air over the seas. During the war years, the Coast Guard met and fulfilled the gravest demands made upon it in all its 155 years of existence. And strengthened by this experience, the service was better prepared at the end of the war in 1945 than ever before in its history to carry out its widespread duties in time of peace. <laughs>